Is it dumb to comply with remote ID if you're flying without a spotter? What do you think is worse? This is a very, very significant philosophical question. Is it dumb to break two laws at once? The argument being that as long as you're breaking one law, who cares? You're non-compliant. You may as well break more laws. And the answer to that question depends a lot on whether breaking the second law makes you more likely to get in trouble for breaking the first law. I've seen these videos, these police police videos, you know, body cam, whatever, all over YouTube. A dude gets pulled over doing 100 miles an hour on the highway. Surprise! He's got a bunch of drugs in his car. Oh, how could this have happened? And the argument goes that if you're going to have a bunch of contraband in your car, then maybe you should drive the speed limit and try not to attract attention to yourself. That's a case where committing the second crime of speeding makes you a lot more likely to get in trouble for the much more serious crime. Now, that's arguably not true for remote ID and a spotter. Here's the thing. Almost all of the time, no one is going to notice if you don't follow the FAA regulations. Almost all of the time, no one's going to notice no one's going to care. I mean, somewhere in an FAA office, there's a there's a person who's like, oh, people are breaking the regulations. <laughs> oh, well, i got to stop this. All oh, these guys. <laughs> you know, so someone cares. <laughs> but no one knows. The only time you're going to get in trouble for breaking the FAA regulations, generally speaking, is if you do something incredibly stupid or reckless. And then when that happens, they throw the book at you. So if they find that you're flying without a spotter, boom, violation. If they find that you're flying without remote ID, boom, violation. And you're going to get charged. I mean, worst case scenario, they don't come out of the gate throwing the book at you. But if you, you know, whatever, if they decide to like really bring the hammer down for whatever reason, they just fine you for every violation that didn't have a part 107, boom, didn't, didn't file for Lance approval, boom, whatever, everything you did wrong, they're going to, they're going to fine you for, and those fines stack up. So if you had remote ID and your drone was registered, but you didn't have a spotter, that's one, one less thing they can fine you for. And I think there's also an argument that if you do come to the FAA's notice and it seems like you were making a good faith effort to be in compliance, but you screwed up, that perhaps they would be more lenient than if they thought you were a scofflaw who was just, I don't know. So I would say generally... Like, the thing is, there's an argument that complying with remote ID is not that hard. You buy a remote ID module, you stick it on the drone, you Velcro it on or whatever, and then you're compliant. So in terms of like a cost-benefit analysis, maybe you're alone and you don't have a spotter, but you're like, oh, here, I'll stick the remote ID module on, and then if I get caught, at least that's one fewer thing they can ding me for. I don't know. I think that some people would feel that that argument was, was valid. I think for most people, it doesn't matter if you're compliant or not, because for most people, especially if you're not doing any kind of commercial work, if you're just flying as a hobbyist, for most people, you will never encounter the FAA, and they will never know whether you're compliant or not. And, and of course, if you are one of the people who gets in trouble, then that's not really going to help you. But I think practically speaking, that's going to be true for most people. Uh, Daft has a follow-up, which he says, one of the points was that RID would attract their attention to detect you without a spotter. My, I would say that uh, the range of RID is pretty short, and our drones are pretty loud. So unless you're trying something very small, which you wouldn't have to have remote ID on anyway, because it was sub-250, they're going to hear your drone and know you're there before they detect your RID signal. Yeah, but this idea that you're out flying and, like, the FAA comes up to you and's like, hey, buddy, do you have remote ID? That's not – that's – the only time anything like that has ever happened has been a – uh, uh, like literally one or two times in all of human history where FAA representatives showed up at a flight event 
and and started checking paperwork. The what's really going to happen is that you're going to freaking land your drone at the Super Bowl because you're a dumbass, and then the cops are going to come get you, and then the FAA is going to throw the book at you. Or, I mean, that's that like. <laughs> There's two ways. Blunty, tell me if I'm tell me if I'm wrong about this. But my my observation, there's two ways that people have gotten in trouble with the FAA so far. And one is that you do something colossally stupid with a drone, like you fly it into the airspace of an of an active airport, like a big airport, or you fly it over a, a stadium during a football game, something colossally stupid, or you are so egregiously obnoxious on YouTube that people start reporting you in mass and then the FAA finally takes notice. Can you think of other examples where people have gotten fined by the FAA or gotten letters from the FAA that don't fit those two scenarios? Legitimately, I'm asking. Uh, I don't think so, but I don't know. I mean, yeah, I'm, I just think the argue, the question is, if I ever have to care about it, is this a differentiating factor? And my, I think my, my thing is, no, it's not a differentiating factor because they'll be there regardless. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Also, the other thing to say is, like, just remember, it's not just if you're flying without a spotter. It's if you're flying without a spotter, if you're flying without your trust test certification, if you're flying without a CBO and knowledge of the CBO's rules. Like, there's a list of things you have to have, right? So just make sure you know that all those things are pieces that, that are required and are as important as the others. Yeah. There's a lot of pieces. And if someone were if someone were to come to the FAA's attention, Blunty, and I, you're not a lawyer, but maybe you, you have enough experience to be able to comment. If not, just say no comment. Like, would each of those be an individual violation? Have we seen when, when there have been actions against people? Like, I know they specifically ding people for flying without a 107. But then would they also fifteen hundred dollars flying without a spotter, fifteen hundred dollars no trust test, fifteen hundred dollars not flying under a CB, uh, CBO's safety rules, or would it all just be fifteen hundred dollars one time not being compliant? I could be wrong, but I don't believe that's how they do it. I think they just take the nastiest one and then nail you with that one. So like not having a one, they find basically find a way to make it a commercial thing and then find you for not having a one hundred seven, which is the worst way to do it because then you're out of the. The, um, the hobbyist. Basically, 44809 is an exception from 107. So you're like mm -hmm. saved from all the rules on 107. As soon as they can nail you on 107, then they just, I think that's the path they did. They, they, they don't, they they don't can't need do that. I, yeah. Yeah. If they can't do that, I don't, I can't even think of a historical situation where, like, other again, other than somebody flying over a football stadium where they've gotten, you know, fines yeah. like that for recreational L activity. Let me ask you this. And again, just from your speak from your experience or tell me no comment, but the the things that, that people have gotten fined for, like I know several people who got FAA attention and what they got them for was not having a 107. They found a way to argue that the flight was commercial. Legitimately, it might have been commercial for whatever reason, but they argued that the flight was commercial. The pilot should have had a 107 and they didn't. Or they violated a TFR, a flight restriction, like by flying over a stadium when there was there's a, there's a there's a flight restriction over every major sports game and and they flew so they they didn't then get them for like and you didn't register the drone and you didn't have a 107 and you or 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 did they I'm sorry what now I don't I missed what, what the question was what there. what have they dinged people for in the past I know they've dinged people for not having a 107. I know they've dinged people for violating a TFR. Have you ever heard of anyone being dinged for not having a spotter or, or other such things? No. It's, it's always the 107 or the TFR. The, no, but I do I, – I'm not 100 percent sure that they publish all those uh, – that's fair. Because like, they have an officially published list, and I'm not sure it does all the civil infractions for all the rec. But I would also say I don't think those happen. Like, like that's why we don't see them, right? Like, I, right. I think we don't hear about them because they're very rare. Like, somebody mentioned they stacked them on Philly Drone Life, but those were separate events. So what we're asking is, do they stack for a single event? So, like, if I'm out flying, will they stack me for no trust, no CBO, no registration, no 107, et cetera, like five, four or five different fines at once. But mm -hmm. the way they stacked up Philly Drone Life was one here, one the next day, one the next day, one this live stream, one this yeah. live stream, one well, this live, a lot stream, of live streams, streams. Over, a, over a history of live streams, and then those were stacked up together. But mm -hmm. they were separate events, just to yeah. be clear. All right. All righty. Well, I think that's enough talking about that topic.